it's exciting to see kind of who's in the room because um, uh, we have some folks from the district here who have a long uh, history of doing action research here in Madison in the school district. Um, do you want to introduce yourselves and just say a word about what you've, what you've done here in Madison? So I'm Mary Claire. I coordinate the um, Madison District Classroom Action Research Program that's been in existence for almost 30 years. And it's been very much a grassroots effort. Um, and it's uh, by professional development staff and also teachers. And um, we have teachers studying their own practice over the course of the year. And this is uh, Kathy Carol Bruce, who I credit with beginning that program oh, almost 30 years ago. And the author of a book with Ken Zeit. Yeah, and, and this is so important because the real work that's being done in this area is being done on the ground in school districts, in communities, um, and uh, typically, you know, people in universities and academics are doing what we can to support that work. In some cases, you know, be involved in that work, but uh, it's really work that's being done on the ground uh, by communities. And I just know there's a, there's a table back there that is doing community-based research. Some of them are working in the area of public health, which is a huge area in which PAR is very active. And people in public health, by the way, get like multi-million dollar grants to do this work in part because it's been shown that using a PAR approach, doing research with people rather than on people, actually results in change in behaviors, whether it's substance abuse, HIV, diabetes, and so on. So it's become a huge, uh, hugely important uh, f uh, approach to research in the area of public health. Also, international development has, has a long time relationship with participatory action research. Um, <clears throat> Um, anybody in international development here? Um, how many of you are sort of with community-based or CBO kind of organizations that are doing community-based PAR, other than that table back there? Okay. How many of you are working in school districts or in schools in some form or other? Okay, quite a few school people. How many of you are doing your work in higher education, maybe with undergraduates, like the center here? <laughs> Uh, there's also a research team. Is anybody here from the, um, um, uh, pardon my um, um, pronunciation, but um, uh, uh, Pao Taub, Pao Taub, the Hmong group? No, I think they'll just be here this afternoon. They'll be here this afternoon, okay. Okay, because I know the center is doing some really interesting PAR research with undergraduate students here as well. Um, so uh, I prepared a, a kind of primer on PAR to kind of talk about some issues of positionality and validity and so on. Um, how many of you are, feel like you don't know that much about PAR and would like a little bit more kind of introductory work on PAR? Let me see your hands. Okay, the rest of you feel pretty, pretty steep because the, the topic, of, but this topic is much more kind of how we can use PAR to make the revolution, right? <laughs> like, you know, how we can like, uh, in these, in these t difficult times of, um, you know, kind of new public management uh, uh, policies that are very much top down and very controlling, how do we begin to think about PAR as maybe one piece of a larger movement uh, that might be able to democratize our institutions, whether they're communities, families, social institutions, schools, et cetera. And, um, I, I have some colleagues in Argentina who during the darkest days of the dictatorship there in the 1970s were working on developing uh, really sort of teacher, they called them workshops, but they really were par workshops based on the work of Paulo Freire and, um, and a, a psychologist named Pichon Riviere. And, and they really, their bigger goal was under a dictatorship condition, how do we re-democratize our social institutions, starting with the family, right? Which is often not a very democratic institution either. And so PAR has, I think, a long tradition in many countries around the world of being sort of a way to start with human relationships, democratizing, democratizing small groups, trying to build that democratization out into the larger social institutions. Um, and we're seeing PAR becoming uh, very popular now in many, in many sectors. It wasn't usually very popular in education itself, although it was in public health and other areas. Um, and I ran into Michelle Fine at AERA and she says, now the, now the concern is, uh, now that it's getting popular, we have to be careful that it isn't commodified and co-opted and made into the five steps to par, right? Like what ha tends to happen with, with most things, right? 
Okay, so one of the debates in PAR is um, kind of what is it, right? Is it just sort of a stance that we take toward things, an approach? Is it a methodology? Um, is it an ontology? Um, and uh, there are people who basically say, you know, because we, it appropriates methods from qualitative and quantitative research, I would say that PAR, for the most part, doesn't have its own particular methods. It uses focus groups and interviews and various other kinds of methods from, uh, that it sort of appropriates from other areas of research. But I think that it can be legitimated as a methodology. And in some sense, <clears throat> it's a different epistemology. It's a different way of knowing the world and being in the world, right? Once you start doing research with other people and it becomes a kind of a new relationship and a new way of generating knowledge, I think the argument could be made for all of these things. And you may be most familiar with this kind of spiral, right? So the basic fundamental idea of the action and the research together is that typically the research uh, is, a, is a, 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 a series of planning, observing and, and acting and reflecting and then based on that a revised plan, uh, acting, observing and so forth. And you've probably seen this, what's called the action research spiral before. This is a fundamental notion of uh, action research and it's, the idea is that you're, you're taking actions in the setting you're in, in order to study those actions and you have a spiraling <coughs> um, action research, this, this makes other researchers very nervous, right? Because if we had an ethnographer in the room studying this session, they would be sitting, this may be somewhat stereotypical if there's an anthropologist in the room, I apologize. They'd be sitting in the corner uh, taking field notes, probably nowadays with a computer, um, and being somewhat a fly on the wall so as not to contaminate the natural setting that's going on here, right? Um, action research sort of breaks all the, those rules and basically says, no, you actually act within the setting and then you study the consequences of those actions. <clears throat> and sometimes it looks more like this, it's a bit more elaborated, but that's the general idea uh, of behind action research. So uh, participatory action research really uh, fundamentally comes out of the work of Paulo Freire who wrote a book in 19, I think in English it came out in 1970, called Pedagogy of the Oppressed, right? And really to understand PAR in its most fundamental, I mean, there have been other traditions of PAR. Uh, Kurt Lewin, uh, German-American sociologist in the 1940s, is sometimes credited as sort of the father of action research. He was a, a social scientist who argued that in order to study uh, social uh, problems that one should actually not theorize them but actually go into work with communities and uh, in the process of try, trying to do problem solving in communities one begins to learn more in a, in a deeper sense a sense of those problems and so that became sort of within the academy the sort of the, one of the original ideas of actually generating knowledge through problem solving in real communities. Um, but he didn't have the sort of critical consciousness piece that Paulo Freire later brought to, to participatory action research. And so <clears throat> um, I just chose a few of his main topics. I teach a course in participatory action research at NYU, and um, uh, we do a really deep dive into pedagogy of the press because that's where the sort of the foundational thought behind PAR, I think, is, is there. Even though uh, he was writing about literacy, adult literacy, um, these principles uh, were transferred over to some of his work. Once he was exiled from Brazil under the dictatorship and went to Chile, he was doing a lot of community-based PAR projects in Chile and translating his literacy work into sort of community, uh, what he would probably call community organizing, but also community research. Um, so some of these basic, I won't go into these in the detail they deserve, obviously, but um, the notion of working the hyphen between these areas is that the space in which these the, the, we work is really not just theory or research, but the hyphen between theory and research. You know that space of tension between the two, theory and practice. Right? All practice is theoretical. All theory is practical. This kind of notion of um, working again the hyphen between theory and practice, and. You know, I'm somebody who, before I became an academic, I had a whole career as a teacher and a, a high school principal. I wasn't, I, I was 40 years old before I had my first academic job. So I always feel like I have one foot in 
practice and one foot in the academy. <clears throat> and so I'm very comfortable in that space in between. But a lot of my colleagues who went right into academia, not necessarily, right? And so it's very hard sometimes to push par because a lot of my colleagues can look at me like, well, that's not how they taught me to do research, right? So that's kind of one of the things we're up against. None of us were really prepared in our doctoral programs to do this kind of work. In fact, it was probably considered somewhat second class because it was working with practitioners and teachers and so forth, right? Um, low prestige. Uh, the dialogic epistemology, this is a key element of PAR. It translates the subject-object relationship in philosophical terms into a subject-subject relationship. So even though we use the term research subject technically in a lot of research, we really are working with research objects, right? We, we, can, we turn the informants into objects of our research. Right? So we invite them to do an interview, but we don't really relate to them subject to subject. Right? We re relate to them as subject to object. And so in, with PAR, that relationship changes. So the expectation now is that both the informant or the participant or the research subject or whatever language we use is now also a subject. And, and there's a kind of co-learning relationship between the two. Right? And so you actually develop a relationship in order to generate knowledge together uh, uh, as a subject-subject uh, uh, relationship. The, the other key concept is this notion of generative themes. Sometimes he used generative words, particularly in literacy uh, context. And um, <clears throat> this is the idea that when you go into a community, you go in with questions, not with answers, right? In other words, you're not, it, 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 it challenges this notion of expertise, right? Who is the expert, right? And if you're going into a community, then the community is the expert on their own lives. You know, you're not. You're coming in to work with them to together because you also bring in some knowledge to the community, right? And so both have something to contribute to the research. Um, pe people, none of us have direct access to our own reality, right? We also construct our own, what, what, this experience I'm having now, I can construct, but I'm still constructing that experience. I don't have some direct, you know, direct access to the truth, right? So it's not like communities or people know what the truth is about their own experience. They're also interpreting it, right? So we don't want to like put the participant on a pedestal as some kind of direct, you know, access to the truth but that knowledge gets generated through bringing in both the insider and outsider perspectives and working together to figure out what, what the truth, so-called, um, is of that, of that particular situation. And Friday and Pedagogy the Oppressed actually was much harder on the political left um, because what was happening in the, when he wrote Pedagogy the Oppressed, which was really the 60s, it was right after the Cuban Revolution, and there were a lot of folks running around uh, trying to create new Cuban revolutions all over Latin America, and for the most part, they were going into communities with what he would consider sort of the party line, right, the answers, trying to, and, and we, we find this now in the United States a little bit, like we're all, we all have some idea of what this like, the Trump supporters are, are like and how we should tell them how to be, right? That they're somehow you know, ignorant and need to be educated and so on and so forth. And instead of going in with questions to try to figure out, so, so what, what is going on with you guys, right? I mean, what, 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 what's happening out there, right? And so the, uh, he was very critical of even progressive you know, Marxists who were going into communities with these, all these answers and trying to get people to go along with the party line and saying, no, that's the wrong approach. You want to go in with questions. And so this idea of a, a, a problem-posing, questioning, uh, pedagogy or research approach to identify the themes in the community that they are interested in doing research on, that they have energy around. Because if you go into a community and say, we want to study domestic violence, but their main energy is around a toxic dump in their community, they're not going to give the time to that if they don't perceive that as the real uh, main issue in their community that they need to research. And so it's very hard to go in and impose that kind of participatory research. Uh, reading the word in the world is a, another key issue that through um, 
and it's related to this last one, the limit situation, so that many people who are oppressed um, uh, have their horizon sort of limited, right? They can't see beyond a certain level. Meeks, for example, growing up working class um, in a small Iowa town, um, you know, I, my father was a factory worker. I became a teacher and my sister became a nurse, right? So it, those are classic working class professions, right? So we, we, it never occurred to any of us to be a doctor, a lawyer, or anything like that because there was a certain, a certain horizon there that had to do perhaps with the social networks we had access to and the ones we didn't have access to and so forth. And so um, people who are oppressed typically live within a kind of limited situation that defines what they're able to sort of see beyond. And so part of Friday's methodology was to begin to help people see beyond that limit situation and to begin to understand the world and the way it worked and how oppression operated in the world and why, for example, they were experiencing the, the poverty or the racism or the homophobia or whatever the issue was that was kind of keeping them within that limit situation. So it's not so much a question for Freire of false consciousness, which is a more Marxist term, but a question more of this kind of limit situation and how people can begin to expand and through reading the word, read the world, right? That was his kind of literacy uh, uh, notion. But the same is true for participatory action research. These are just a handful of key conceptual um, ideas that uh, ground participatory action research. Um, the, th the interesting thing about action, participatory action research and what makes it, I think, so difficult in the, in, 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 the, in the academy, you know, in terms of people taking it seriously as research, right, is that it isn't just research. It's a lot more than just research. It, it, it has a goal of generating knowledge and, uh, and uh, generating knowledge out of um, communities with people. Um, so it can be a new, a new, an important source of knowledge. In fact, when you're doing research with people, I would argue you're getting a much deeper and more valid level of, of trustworthiness of the actual data you're getting because if some stranger comes to interview me, I'm gonna have some kind of story to tell them depending on who I think they are and who they think I am, right? But it may not be the real story, <laughs> right? And we know that interviews are social constructions, right? They're, you know, each one is constructing the situation and telling what they think, you know. And when you do, but when you have that other kind of relationship, that subject-subject relationship, that more intimate relationship, the level of data that you're going to get is far deeper and far more trustworthy and far more valid, in a sense, than the kind of data you would get with just an interview study. Um, it's, but it's also a form of organizing in the sense that it can lead to collective action. So a PAR project typically, again, getting back to the action notion, right, any PAR project should have some kind of action connected to it, right, because it's the idea of generating knowledge for action or taking actions and understanding, generating knowledge out of understanding the response to those actions. And so um, when PAR is done in, in groups, those groups often engage in some kind of collective action. Now there's some interesting differences between community organizing and PAR. And community organizing comes out of Saul Alinsky's um, work, um, uh, Revelé for Radicals is sort of the classic if you want to get steeped in Saul Alinsky's work. Um, and so oftentimes when PAR people and, action, and community organizers work together, there's some struggle because for PAR, it's partly about about uh, gathering data and information and moving based on that information to the next action, right? Whereas an, a community organizer is more likely to say, well, we won that one, let's go do this. You know, like they're much more like action-oriented, PAR folks are action-oriented, but also generating knowledge. So they might stop to do some oral histories or some life histories with the community or some other kind of data gathering around the next action that they take. Um, an intervention, um, it can also be an intervention. So this is what I was saying before about, say, the, uh, which is usually called C CBPR, Community-Based Participatory Research in, in the field of public health, which the table back there may be more familiar with. Um, uh, 
where the idea is not only to generate knowledge, but also to change behaviors. And those behaviors can be around substance abuse and various And oftentimes, in fact, we have, there's a big project going on in Patterson, New Jersey right now that my wife, Catherine Hur is involved with um, uh, around substance abuse and using a, um, a big PAR uh, project. And usually those larger, heavily funded PAR projects tend to use much more mixed methods. They tend to gather a lot of quantitative data as well as interview data. <coughs> Um, and currently, they have a, and they have different pieces of the data. Currently, they're they're interviewing sex workers in in Patterson, and then they take the data then to the city council and try to bring about change using that data. And sometimes it's not quite as participatory as purists would would want, right? It, sometimes it's it, it does fall into more doing research for rather than doing research with, in the sense that sometimes they'll gather data that then they they take to the, to the places where decisions are made to feed that information from the community into that. It may not be in part because doing research with is very labor intensive because it requires a lot of time to build that trust. Uh, sometimes the first year of a project might be nothing more than achieving those relationships in order to do the authentic uh, forms of PAR. And then finally, um, as a form of pedagogy that has a goal of uh, creating some level of critical consciousness. Um, a lot of the youth par, for example, that I'll talk about in a minute, um, is much more sort of pedagogically oriented uh, toward, particularly when you're working with youth. Question? I'm wondering, um, do you put a lot of distinctions between like action research, participatory yeah. action research, community-based participatory <laughs> research, because I feel like people use them fairly interchangeably. Yeah. Um, and I've heard some people like really argue against that, and other people like, yeah, generally we're all talking about the same. Yeah, they're, they're different, different variants that have come out of typically different traditions. Um, so they originated in different areas by different people in say public health, international development, schools and education. Um, um, well, there, there are other areas that it's been done in. And so each of those has its own sort of unique tradition, in many cases its own sort of original theorists that they're grounded in. So I think it makes sense to say people who talk about CBPR, that acronym there, like CBPR, you know, that's the, that's the community-based public health people. And, and they approach it a bit differently, oftentimes because they're working with communities, large communities. Education people are often working in more smaller groups with students, for example, in a YPAR project. You're usually not dealing with a whole community, although it can spill over into the community. So there are different, different questions of scale, I guess, in some cases. Um, so, Like what's the, Tony Bright is using this implementation science now that looks exactly, I, mean, I don't know how much you know about the implementation science, this learning to improve stuff that Tony Bright put out with the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. But it's like if you look into it, it's basically participatory action research. Interesting. But calling it something different. And in fact, even like the program evaluation, the evaluation literature has blended with PAR in many cases, the sort of stakeholder evaluation stuff and so forth. Uh, I know Tony Breich, I don't know that particular, if he's talking about implementation in the sort of traditional sense of that idea of mutual, mutually adap adapting policies in order to uh, re, re adequate, is that a word, make them more adequate for the ground level. I'm assuming that's where he's going with that. But yeah, I mean, you know, this is where it gets, it, it gets into more of a stance than a methodology, right? So each, each setting, each, you know, discipline will appropriate PAR in its own way, in a way that makes the most sense. And each PAR project will have, like any research, will have its own limitation section, right? So, uh, you know, every PAR project is not going to be, and this is something my students always, when we start reading PAR projects, and they go, yeah, but they didn't, but, but they didn't, the participants didn't generate the questions together, or they didn't, weren't involved in writing up the final report, or they weren't involved in like analyzing the data together collaboratively, right? So they get really purist and every single phase of the project has to be absolutely, you know, 
uh, collaborative and so <laughs> forth. And the fact is that in certain situations that may or may not make sense. We kind of forget that the whole point is what do the participants want to do? Right? They, may not want to, they may not have an incentive to write up a report at the end, right? So why include them in that, right? Doesn't make any sense, right? So again, every PAR project has, is going to encounter a set of obstacles and so forth. So if you're using PAR as a dissertation, anybody thinking of doing a dissertation or a thesis using PAR? So if you're thinking about a dissertation, you, ha you have some automatic constraints, right? Like that's supposed to be your individual work. <laughs> and so if it's a PAR collaborative project, how do you account for your role in that? Um, how do you think about a project that you can do in a year, which unless you want to hang out for three or four years to do your dissertation or even five, then you have to figure out how to make a PAR project fit a, a year, right? And there are ways to do that that we can talk about later if you want. I've had students doing PAR dissertations too, but um, it's, you know, each, each situation is unique and, and, and has, to, with, as with any research, has to be figured out how to uh, 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 implement it. I, I just want to build on one thing that I think in the Madison School District, one thing we learned is that as more and more programs started to um, be created that wanted to look, you know, that wanted to look sort of like this generic model of action research where there was a formula, we realized that the most important thing was for us to keep articulating our values and what we stood for. So that everybody, and I think that's partly why we're still around after 30 years, is that we could say this is what the program stands for and is about. So we were able to sort of distinguish ourselves from some of that messiness of, oh, that's, that's what those people are doing. It's easy to theorize par in the academy, right? And then when you're out in the real world, it, it, then you have to really figure things out. It's messy research, right? It, and it requires, after every cycle, requires rethinking the next step, right, it carefully. Um, okay, let me move on. Um, and we've talked a little bit about this, but there's this, this whole question of positionality. In our book, The Action Research Dissertation, we, we have a whole chapter on positionality because it's such an important issue for PAR. Um, a lot of the work that I used to work with was what we would call insider uh, action research, which was basically maybe a teacher doing action research in a classroom, uh, a principal doing action research in his or her school, uh, a group of teachers doing action research in their own school. So in this case, all of those folks are insiders to the organization that they're, they're working in or in a community you might have a similar situation. It, what par, par becomes, I guess you could still say those are PAR projects if they're participatory action research projects, but oftentimes PAR involves either an insider going into a community or a community inviting an outsider in when they recognize that they need some kind of expertise that they don't have. And that's where I think the issues of positionality become difficult. The insider positionality is also a difficult one because you don't have the outsider perspective. You have such an insider perspective that as anthropologists might say, you've, you've gone native, right? You, you can no longer see things that an outsider might come in and see. And so each of those outsider or insider perspectives have their own advantage. So bringing those together can actually be actually quite generative. Um, the ideal, I suppose, would be there in the middle of a kind of insider-outsider team in which uh, you have both insiders and outsiders working together to generate knowledge. That, of course, requires a massive amount of time and trust building and so forth to get those groups together, as we, we've seen in universities when we've tried to do collaborative work with schools. Um, you have different cultures coming together with different incentive systems and different um, um, a viewpoint, so it requires a lot of trust building to build those kinds of teams over time. Um, and it's also uh, important who invites who into the research, right? If I'm, in, uh, if, if I'm going into a community to do research and I have a big grant, let's say, um, then I'm not being invited into the community. I'm entering the community and trying to build enough trust to be able to do research with that community very different than if a community invites me into the community, 
for my own particular expertise. Uh, so um, the question is often, you know, who is the insider? So, for example, this this uh, research pr project the center is doing with the uh, Hmong students. Um, so typically, we would say, okay, so um, Matt and uh, Matt and Bailey are the outsiders doing research with Hmong, who are the insiders to their community. But there's how many participants? Maybe ten, eight, seven or so. Okay. So, to what extent are they insiders? In the sense, to the, what extent do they represent the Hmong, the larger Hmong community? Right. So there's there's it's kind of like Chinese boxes, right? It's, it gets really complicated the more you think about it. So you may be working with a CBO in an organ in a, in a community, but to what extent does that CBO represent the community? Um, and so this insider-outsider thing has to be thought through very carefully. Um, and, uh, and then the other issue is the working as a position within a hierarchy. This comes, I work in a leadership, right? So when, if I have a principal who wants to do action research in his or her school, then it raises all kinds of questions about that person's position in the hierarchy doing research with teachers, for example, in which case, how do you build that trust when you have those power differences relating to the hierarchy uh, within the organization? And then, to make things more complex, um, and this is an issue particularly with um, international development and kind of global issues, but also um, domestic uh, situations where you have the danger of be using PAR, uh, but ultimately having it be a colonizing stance. A lot of people who work for NGOs, for example, and go into uh, other countries to do this kind of work uh, have to struggle with this notion of uh, being sort of using this as a sort of velvet glove kind of colonizing way to get access and so on. And you have some people who have written about this. Um, Linda uh, Tw Twy Smith, who's a, a Maori from New Zealand, has a, has a classic book on it, Lee Patel, Django Paris, and so on. Um, uh, this uh, Souza Santos, a Brazilian scholar, a, a Portuguese scholar, writes about a, 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 the epistemology of the South, of the, of the global South, right? And this idea of the, the generating knowledge from the global South, the global North. And then power relations associated with one's gender, race, class, and sexuality. So as you move into a, a situation, uh, our own positionalities of being white, Latinx, black, Asian, um, male, female, um, uh, uh, cisgendered, et cetera, all of those things uh, come into play in terms of how we will be perceived and how we will perceive others and the quality of the, the, the trust building again and the, and the quality of the data that we, that we generate. And there are a couple of books I want to recommend if you're interested in these issues. Um, Patricia Hill Collins and Selma Bilge have a book just called Intersectionality. And the interesting thing about this is they see PAR as really an important element of the issues of intersectionality. So in the academy, we talk about intersectionality as kind of a, an intellectual debate that was, we usually cite Kimberly Crenshaw, 1992, intersectionality. But actually, communities have been dealing with intersectionality forever, right? And that there's a whole debate going on around communities and community organizers and so forth around intersectionality and how that's dealt with. And they really take that sort of seriously and say that, you know, the, the, the academy needs to get out of their ivory tower and into communities to see what's actually going on around intersectionality. Um, and another one that's fairly new, Elizabeth Drame, who I think is at UW Milwaukee or something, a, a faculty member in their College of Education, and uh, Dakota Irby have done a piece, a uh, really interesting book, and there's an article version of this too that I use in my class that's where they, she talks about work that she did in New Orleans where she came in as an African-American woman, but so in that sense, she was seen as sort of an insider, but the fact is she wasn't from New Orleans, so then she wasn't an insider because she wasn't local, and she also came from a university in Wisconsin, and so she had that identity of the academic, and so these multiple identities that we carry around with us into these projects all have to be theorized and thought through in terms of how we enter a setting. Um, 
then uh, I wanted to put a little bit of emphasis on participatory action research with youth, um, community-based versus organization-based. I think we talked a little bit about that. Um, uh, we work a lot with youth in schools, which is a lot different than working with youth in communities, right? Because we talked about this a little bit beforehand, where if you're in an organization like a school and you're doing par with youth, it's going to be very empowering for those youth. And those youth are going to, and my wife had a, a situation where suddenly the youth are on their way down the hall to talk to the principal about something that, you know, and, and she's going, oh my gosh, am I putting them at risk? You know, like, you know, are they going to get in trouble? So you have all this kind of these professional dilemmas, like, well, am I the teacher now? Or am I like an equal now? And, um, and you know, like, how does this work exactly, right? Or the kids in your classroom become empowered and then they start asking certain questions in other teachers' classrooms who don't necessarily appreciate that. And so then you get in trouble. There's all kinds of of issues that come up when you're doing this kind of research in a school or a school district that I'm sure Mary and you guys could talk about as well. Um, so a lot of the par with use is done in uh, nonprofits, community-based organizations, and working with youth and after-school programs and things like that, where the risk factors are not quite as as difficult as working, you know, within schools. But I think school-based programs are really important. And the second one, um, I was just at, in Toronto at the American Educational Research Association. There's a lot of sessions on PAR. And I noticed that the, a lot of the sessions are on ethnic studies programs, particularly on the West Coast, California, Southwest. Um, and the most famous one is this ethnic studies program in Tucson that really was grounded in a participatory action research um, um, approach. Um, and the, the students were in, they were using a Freudian method, and the students were becoming very empowered, very much uh, exploring their own identities, uh, particularly Mexican-American students. Uh, and the interesting thing is that there's some good studies done that show that it led to better achievement levels for the students. Because really, you know, we think about achievement as just cognitive interventions, but sociocultural interventions are actually, one could argue, as effective, if not more, than the cognitive ones. Because when a student begins to feel more empowered, more in, 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 in respecting their own identities and their own histories and so forth, they also then begin to see that ideas are in fact important, that yeah, they do need to study. And I have some quotes here that I'm going to skip from that project um, in, in, the, in the interest of time. But um, what happens is that you then create a kind of third space for, for students in these kinds of programs. And here I'm drawing on Homi Baba's work. Uh, of third space as a kind of hybrid space that exists between first and second space. First space being one's own sort of uh, identity, um, whether that's in a, in a sort of neocolonial sense or in a sense of, of, of the Hmong students, for example, that you're working with, um, and the, a, a dominant culture. And so a lot of people live within that hybrid space in between the dominant culture and their own sort of um, uh, of social identities, and and how do we create the third spaces that sort of honor that in a way that helps students n negotiate those identities within, what, what, particularly when their identities are stigmatized within the larger society, and that that stigmatization is often we now kind of call it implicit bias. We have other words for it, but basically, um, that stigmatization is what's getting in the way of them actually achieving a sense of, of a powerful identity and seeing themselves as powerful in the world and being able to um, um, achieve academically. And so what we're seeing is that those, those PAR-oriented projects are actually resulting in higher levels of student achievement. Interestingly, because this pro program was in Arizona, it was actually shut down um, at one point. I don't know how many of you remember that, about 10 years ago or so. It was shut down by the state legislature because they were teaching kids, I don't know, I forget what language they were using, to, to hate America or hate white people or something. And so they shut it down and they banned the books that were being used in that program. They banned Pedagogy of the Oppressed. You couldn't, a teacher couldn't use that book in their class for about eight or nine years in Arizona. They just won a court case a, le a year ago or so that they have reinstated the program. But this is how powerful <laughs> these programs are, can be, right, um, for students. Um, 
and a lot of these participatory action programs with youth appropriate popular education um, methods. So for example, um, something like the, the, the problem tree, which is uh, this notion of getting at root causes of problems. So what Fred H. talks about in Pedagogy of the Press is in order to engage in dialogue, we, you have to have some kind of, he calls them codes, sometimes he calls them triggers. And a trigger is something that you, as somebody who is facilitating a participatory action research project might, with youth, might use in order to start some kind of dialogue around a specific kind of issue that m might be of interest. So once you've identified the generative themes, then you might use something like this as a trigger for discussion. So if we use the problem tree, I know this kind of blurred out when I expanded it, but you have basically the problem identification in the middle, and then what feeds the symptoms are the branches. It's a brainstorming exercise basically to do with, with, with youth. Um, and then what are the roots of the, of the problem? And so this again, getting back to that limit situation is a way to move beyond in order for people to begin to analyze. This is the problem we experience and the problem that we see. This is kind of a, a, the problem and the symptom, but what are the effects and what are the causes? And to brainstorm around this so that students can begin to talk about what are the roots of the problem? Why aren't schools working? Why isn't school working for us was kind of the question here. What's wrong with New York City schools? Um, and so they begin to have a very sophisticated analysis of that. Um, and, th and there are a number of these kinds of, of, uh, of um, methods, uh, particularly now in the digital age, uh, people in PAR are using like photo voice. We used to hand out to the kids the, the disposable cameras and they'd go out and take pictures of things that they were interested in in their community and then we'd use those as triggers for, for dialogue, right? Now, of course, they just use their cell phones and take videos, um, uh, digital storytelling, participatory uh, um, geographic information systems, which is kind of mapping of communities, um, some experiment, uh, experiments with using PAR online and so forth. So this is kind of the new direction that a lot of PAR is moving in. Um, I'm going to make a little bit of a shift here. Um, the uh, PAR has become much more popular now in academic circles. Um, uh, it was quite marginal for a long time. You can see here, in, uh, I did a search in ProQuest for PAR academic mentions, and um, you can see that the, in, and from in the 80s, there were only 14 <laughs> total, and now in 2010 to 2019, 8,778. So you can see that this popularity is growing. Um, now the question is, is that good news or should we be concerned that it may uh, get co-opted in certain ways? Yeah? How well do you feel like it represents those, these sort of synonyms or some of the things we've talked about? Like yeah. people are calling it by a different name, yeah. but it... So it would be even bigger because all I did was look for PAR. So CVPR wouldn't be included here. Um, Probably action research would because it, it was participatory action research. Although if I s search for just action research, there'd be a lot more. Um, so I was just trying to get a very general sense of, of this. Um, so, so as this interest in PAR grows, it's obviously uh, hit some kind of nerve in people. It makes sense. Yeah, we should be, you know, like thinking about this in terms of a more democratic approach to research, a more ethical approach to research. Um, and uh, so how might PAR represent a new epistemology of school reform to the extent that it legitimates the knowledge of students, teachers, and communities, right? So part of this is a move to, we might think of uh, them as counter narratives, you know, or testimonials or some kind of um, way to bring uh, voices that typically are not heard into the conversation in a more authentic way than if we just go out and interview people or survey people, right? Um, so they are actually in control of the research to some extent that gets, um, so there's this slogan, nothing about us without us, that some of the youth use, right? Like, like you know, we, we, we want to tell our own stories. We don't want other people telling them for us. Um, and so one of the things that we did, and I'm not going to spend any time on this because if you're interested, it's, it's in our action research dissertation book, but we went about and said, well, if, from an academic perspective, how might we rethink issues of validity or trustworthiness? Because 
you know, qualitative research was often evaluated based on positivist criteria and therefore found wanting. Same thing happens with PAR. If you're applying the, 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 the criteria of a good ethnography to PAR, it's going to fall short. So what would the validity criteria be? And so we sort of played around with this a bit. And two of the, 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 the ones that we added uh, are this notion of democratic validity is to what extent is the study inclusive of um, of the participants and multiple voices, and to what extent it, does it have catalytic validity in the sense that it brings about some change not only in the participants but also in the researcher, right? That the researcher should all, it's a co-learning project, right? The researcher also should be changed in some way by this research. So I'm going to just spend maybe, um, running out of time a bit here, but maybe five or 10 minutes on this part, which is kind of the, the more policy part of, the, of my talk. Um, so we know that schools and schooling, and this I'm here I'm gonna focus more on, on K-12 education, but the implications for higher education I think are pretty clear as well. Our school system during the early 20th century was basically created by business people based on the factory model, right? So that's why we had this highly bureaucratized uh, standardized uh, uh, school system uh, and then the second business model which started in the 1970s 80s um, was based on high stakes testing right so it was all about outcomes um, measuring outcomes and testing and and markets and competition among schools and competition within schools and so on and so forth so it was a it was a more I guess what Foucault would call like a new technology of power that instead of being controlled in the old factory model by your immediate supervisor, you're now being controlled at a distance by these new mechanisms like high stakes testing and markets. So as a teacher in a classroom, you're no longer worried about when the principal's gonna come to observe you, although now they've even made that more like they, there are these walkthroughs, you know. But, but you're now disciplined by the test scores. <laughs> so you're thinking, I better not do that unit I used to do because it's gonna be considered off task and I need to be like doing this other thing that will raise their test scores and so on and so forth. So we, we know that there's this kind of second business model, total quality management, all this stuff that is now um, bearing down on us. And again, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but you basically, um, these are sort of the things that we all, viewing the public sector as a profit center, you know, introductory of markets and so on. Um, so what this has spawned is a grassroots movement, as we know, across the country. Um, uh, this is uh, Los Angeles, the UTLA strike, the recent one in LA. There was also one in Oakland. Um, no, this is not your Capitol building down the street. This is Oklahoma, right? <laughs> These are Oklahoma teachers, the, probably the reddest state in the country, right? Uh, protesting um, this second business model of education and the impact it's having on teachers, as well as since 2008, the fact that states have no money and are not paying teachers. I think they're making 36,000 a year in, in Oklahoma, right? Uh, so, Part of the problem, and I'll end with these, comparing these two knowledge frameworks, you know, the traditional way that we think about mobilizing knowledge or creating knowledge has traditionally been that it's created in universities by people like us, right, <laughs> academics, and we disseminate our knowledge through things like publications, conferences, workshops, consultancies, and so forth. And the idea, the theory is then that it kind of trickles down somehow and this is your implementation piece back there with Tony Brake, I guess, uh, <laughs> into this knowledge utilization, implementation kind of thing uh, into practice or policy makers pick it up and, and make decisions. And over the years, it's gone from this idea of mutual adaptation of the policy to this notion that we use now of fidelity, that things have to be implemented exactly the way they were done in the experimental design that, that was used to uh, uh, create the curriculum. And so what I want to suggest is that that whole technocratic knowledge model has to be rethought. And that means that universities have to rethink how they think about mobilizing knowledge. Universities are no longer the main, power, uh, main knowledge brokers in society. You know, they have a lot of competition now. 
And um, so the new knowledge mobilization framework that we're living under today, and that is, uh, it, it, and I'll tell you about the, the good and the bad of it, actually, is that knowledge creation is actually being done in multiple sites. The good news there is that groups like PAR and so forth are actually generating knowledge that is in, in collaboration with communities and with teachers and so forth. And that represents new forms of knowledge generation in different sites than traditional universities. On the other hand, the other sites that are generating knowledge are things like um, think tanks like the Heritage Foundation and the American Enterprise Institute and ALEC and so forth. And, um, and so a lot of the knowledge that's getting out there is highly ideological and heavily funded by venture philanthropists and foundations and, and wealthy people with a, a definite political agenda. Um, and so there's a, a real competition now for who generates knowledge, you know, where that knowledge is coming from. Um, and so that means that <clears throat> instead of disseminating the knowledge, we need to start thinking about knowledge mobilization um, and where that knowledge is coming from. Is it, is it being funded by big money and with an ideological agenda? Is it funded by the fossil fuel industry and these groups that are now disseminating knowledge um, that people often can't tell the difference between a, a real study and one that's been funded by an industry that that uh, will benefit from uh, the new common sense that they create in society. Um, and then this idea of knowledge instead of knowledge utilization, maybe more this idea of knowledge appropriation or enactment in which people have more agency in terms of how they take up that knowledge and how they use it. Um, um, so as I say, you know, these multiple sites of creation include a lot of these new organizations that have a lot of power and a lot of money to determine how we think about things um, and the kind of knowledge we consume and the formats through which we consume that knowledge. Um, and then at the same time, we have these grassroots organizations that are generating knowledge. There are lots of interesting teachers organizations in New York. We have a group called Teachers Unite that does their own research studies about things that they, that they are, feel are important. NICOR, um, all around in Chicago, there's a couple of social justice teacher organizations. Um, there's some academics that are involved in those organizations working with teachers to generate alternative forms of knowledge about education to challenge um, some of these other uh, uh, think tanks. Um, community parent-led organizations, the opt-out movement, Mothers on the Move, lots and lots of community-based organizations that are now in the business of generating knowledge and reports and blogs and so forth, right? Um, and also the use of social media has become hugely important. Um, you know, I co-authored a piece with um, a former colleague, um, Michael Dumas, um, on an online journal. and. I expected 100 people, you know, not how many people usually read our articles, right? Well, it was like, you know, a couple thousand people the first week were reading it, and I thought, what is that? Well, it turns out my colleague is younger and very uh, uh, active on social media, <laughs> Facebook and all this stuff, and so suddenly, like, it was circulating in a way that I've never seen before, right? So we have different, you know, new ways of, of circulating knowledge that we didn't have before that we need to learn to take advantage of. And I know that this question of um, how to disseminate knowledge is one that you guys are interested in pursuing as well. Um, and so how do we get this PAR knowledge out there to a, to a, to a larger audience? And, um, and then in terms of the appropriation and enactment of this knowledge, um, how to, the traditional one, people are teachers and most of us, when we do a research article, we have these people in mind, the top ones, right? But we have these new people that are consuming knowledge now, which are grassroots teachers organizations, plus the unions, but also outside the unions. You know, this big union movement nationally, or the, the strikes that we had, saw in West Virginia and Oklahoma and these places, they were Facebook organized. The unions in those states are very, are very small and not very powerful. And so the teachers organized, in, often in spite of the unions, right? The unions were way behind them. The teachers were organizing on Facebook. I mean, that, that's kind of the new, the new <laughs> way that people are, are dealing with information. 
um, community organizers and CBOs, parent organizers, reporters, the general public, and so on. And I will, this is Madison <laughs> from 20, what, 2011, I think. Um, so it all started here, right, in uh, 2011 with the, um, uh, the, the ALEC and the anti-labor. Um, so it's a good example where, where an organization, a think tank like ALEC, which is much more than a think tank, it's really a lobby organization, but we're able to have a massive influence in a state like Wisconsin. Um, and so how do we counter that kind of power in terms of knowledge uh, mobilization by these new grassroots movements centered in PAR. PAR being a little piece of that, but I think an increasingly important one. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, so another framework that I think is important or worth mentioning, because I do think there are some important distinctions, is um, it's called research justice, and it's a framework developed by community organizers um, that Data Center is an organization where you can Google and you can find some information. And um, I think it's valuable because um, it's, it's community organizers saying, like, we know data is useful to us, and working with researchers can also be useful. Um, but two key distinctions I see is, one, the agenda is being set by the, the community organizers and the campaigns or the issues that they are working against. And then um, researchers are being invited to the table mm -hmm. as somebody who can contribute something. So you know that the, the power dynamics are different because it's starting from a different place. Uh, and then in that framework too, the data that researchers, the academics bring, is just one valuable set of data and tools that's put on the same, um, same kind of standing as lived experience, cultural mm. knowledge, spiritual knowledge, everything else that everyone else invited to that table brings. Mm. So I just really like bringing that out there. And I credit um, Carlina Sarmiento, who's a professor here at UW-Madison, who's put that on my radar. It's not, uh, there's one book I know of that's written by academics on this idea of research justice, um, but it's really uh, another framework that I think is really important um, that also hopefully will not be co-opted and appropriated. Right. <laughs> so yeah. look yeah. into it. Yeah, no, that's really, I hadn't heard of that. And I mean, in theory, Parr would not disagree with that analysis, meaning that the, you know, the, the whole idea is that the community ultimately is the arbiter of the knowledge and the actions that are taken and so on. But you're right, and it gets back to who's inviting who into the research. And, and I've, I've been involved with community-based participatory action research, all of that, um, for probably 10 years now. And, and I think this is a really important distinction because I also know that I've been partnering with some organizations where it takes three years of relationship development to tell me, for them to feel comfortable enough to tell me of, oh, when you did this, <laughs> that was not cool. When you did that, that was actually not what we were interested in. But, you know, the power dynamics, especially when you're coming from the university, like, you can't just wish them away. No, no. And, and I think, you know, folks who are, you know, working at a school district, you know, there's another set of power dynamics. If you're at a clinic, another set of power dynamics. And so this, this that starting point of, you no, know, we are inviting you here mm -hmm. because we think you have something of value, I think it just, yeah. it starts. And I think that's important in terms of where the grant money should go, right? Because it often goes to the researchers and the universities, and so they're in control of the project, and they have their own timelines they have to fit, and so forth. And it's, it's much rarer for community organizers to get that kind of money to invite people in or, or you know, there, there are all these like constraints that are out there that often get in the way of having that kind of authentic, bottom-up, grassroots uh, dynamic. Um, I have a question. So I did my PhD in educational administration, um, and I found that no one in my department was interested in being able to work with communities <clears throat> in any way, shape, or form. I don't even think they viewed the principal or the superintendent as a community leader in general. Um, the concept of community schools was like totally absent. The idea of inviting community members in, 
you know, we had these like site-based management teams, but they were basically BS. Um, Total quality management. Yeah, yeah, it's like this, you know, <laughs> we, we have a committee, we invite a parent who, you know, is a stay-at-home mom to come and be on our committee, and then we say we have the community involved. Like, it was a total... Um, but that's, know, that's changing in the field. If you look at um, Terrence Green, who's one of the graduates here, I think, awesome. with Colleen Capper, right, is writing about community organizing and educational administration. Uh, Khalifa, uh, Mohammed Khalifa is another one, and Anna Ishimaru in, at University of Washington, um, there's a number of people now that are beginning to look at less school-centric and more community-centric views of change in schools. Yeah, and that's great because it's a great line of research, but what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is I found that the training of principals and teachers to welcome this in was totally not keeping up. So the only group that I knew of was the Center for Cities and Schools at UC Berkeley, who's really training... Um, for instance, educational leaders in urban policy and understanding structural issues in cities and understanding the connection between neighborhood improvement and school improvement. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering what what do you know that is going on to like maybe it's through UCEA or something to actually change the way that principals and teachers are taught to think differently than outside of just their classroom. Well, it's partly how the professors are taught in their doctoral programs and they're not taught they're taught traditional research approaches. So with my, even with my progressive colleagues, they kind of give me this blank look when I talk about practitioner research or PAR or something, because it's not part of their experience in their doctoral program. So until we intervene at that level, I think, um, you know, how many PAR, PAR doctoral dissertations in the College of Education, how many faculty in the College of Education could even supervise a PAR dissertation other than maybe Bailey and <laughs> Matt, you know, it, it, it starts there. I mean, it's, that's been the, the, welcome to my life, right? I mean, I, well, but I'm wondering, like, is there an inter, <laughs> I mean, are you kind of allying yourself with other colleagues in the field? To try you know, there's a small group in educational administration. There's a few universities. Hofstra University had a cluster of people for a while. Rowan at New Jersey, um, Gail Furman at um, Washington State. There have been places where people like me have, have had a, a group of three or four people who kind of got it and were working with practitioners around that. But by and large, there's no incentive to do that kind of work. It's not rewarded in terms of publication. You know, everybody either does qualitative research or they do quantitative research. And that's pretty much it. That's what everybody's trained to do. So it gets into people's own sense of their own professional efficacy, right? That they're, they're no, none of us like to, to, to push our comfort zone outside what we, what we know, right? It's very challenging. And so while I think there's some, and it's also seen as not as prestigious research, it's, and even today it's worse because in universities now, the pressure on assistant professors to do, you know, even more traditional kinds of research and publish in more traditional kinds of journals makes it even less likely that anybody is going to be interested in A, working with practitioners, period, and B, doing that kind of research that isn't considered very legitimate within the academy. So I know that's a very depressing outlook, but I do see, some, that's why I mentioned those few people who are, I think, at least taking a community organizing view of educational leadership. You probably know that there is an entire civic engagement movement in higher education. Camp, I, I used to run, selfishly, an organization called Wisconsin Campus Compact, and they're trying to change tenure promotion guidelines. I mean, anybody knows the mortgage center here, you might know the civic action planning process. Yeah. They're trying to change the culture of UW, but I found that like, people like you are wildly disconnected from not any, any fault of you, because you're just in your own academic silo like are kind of wildly disconnected from the broader civic engagement movement and you're saying the exact same things that are said at these civic engagement conferences but like you're saying it in the educational administration space and it's it's hard to like like because there are people talking about this in public health there are people talking about this in education right. but yet like none of them are really coming to the table to help change the tenure and promotion guidelines 
help change expectations. Well, I think that's kind of one of the reasons we like, like what Matt said when you first introduced um, Dr. Anderson was we're trying to create a community here to work on some of these things because I think that's something we all recognize is, is needed. It's mm -hmm. like there are folks who all care about this, but we're working from different disciplines and different terminology sometimes. You know? So much of the civic engagement stuff has been co-opted, service learning, stuff like that. So I think, um, you know, it's been co-opted in large part by a more traditional kind of workforce preparation model that I think you guys are struggling against as well, right? Um, not that there isn't potential there for, because a, a I mean, a lot of those programs could be used as cover for PAR to bring PAR in um, to the so, sort of uh, civic engagement models. I think that these issues of how do we get, because a lot of faculty want to work with communities, and so how do we build that into the tenure process and so forth, has been a conversation at every university at some point. But I think the larger pressures of applied fields having to compete with the arts and sciences, with, I mean, provosts and presidents, they really see real research as what, what arts and sciences does, not what applied fields do. And so when deans of colleges of education take their, send their files forward for tenure and promotion, they want them to look like an arts and sciences file. You know, because the, the provost and the people, as you get further out, are going to look at something and go, what the hell is this? You know, this isn't real research. So I think that we're, what we're up against is... And, and if anything, that sort of thinking has been even more solidified now as we're bringing in more economists to education. We're bringing in more people who, uh, ever since the NRC report about, what's that, 10 or 15 years ago that established experimental designs as the gold standard, any kind of humanities-oriented research or alternative kind of research has been struggling to get any kind of legitimacy within this, this, this model. And I know that's the case at NYU. I mean, our, our dean is an economist. He's brought in a whole bunch of economists. You know, uh, we don't have any lay, lay philosophers and historians and anthropologists anymore. You know, this is a trend, I think, in a lot of universities. Um, and so it's, and the younger faculty are under much more um, pressure to publish a certain kind of research. Um, I mean, I'm hearing myself being very pessimistic about this, but at the same time, you know, uh, we, I, you saw the, the, the increase in PAR studies, for example, you know, so at the, t at the same time that's happening, it's like the larger society, right? At the same time that we're, 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 we're getting new public management everywhere, um, there are also these grassroots groups that are, that are organizing and trying to bring about change. And, you know, one person can't do anything about it. It has to be a collective group of people that get together and, and, make, a, and make a difference. And that can happen through sometimes um, faculty senates and faculty groups that have, have some power. But um, yeah, you're right. But I think, the, I think the connecting with the civic, I think you're right. The, we don't really connect enough with the civic engagement people. And, and, you know, maybe you can send me some things that, that I could, you know, look at and, and, you know, that might be another. We, we need to build allies across different, different folks working on similar issues. Yeah, Erica? As an untenured faculty member, I would say that I think <laughs> you could get really focused on, like, how tenure promotion doesn't align well with PAR, which, but... I would say, like, I wasn't trained in this way to do this. Right? There's not the time to learn pre-tenure, but my hope is post-tenure, um, when there are many tenured faculty members, you're both, you know you're going to be in a community if you're there, right, which is not at all the case in the, like, as an untenured faculty member, you don't really know if you're going to end up in that community. So I think, don't limit the thing to thinking about untenured faculty members, because um, that might, is not very changeable, I don't think all of these different reasons and even from the perspective of the faculty members themselves if they want to do that sort of thing. Um, I mean, if there's more people who are trained coming up, they can get the whole like, um, ball rolling like folks are now. Um, I think there also are like journals, the prestigious journals in education, AERJ, things like that. Um, well, editors will say, it's not that we don't publish PAR or these other kinds of research. We don't get manuscripts, right? So sometimes we're our own worst enemy. You know, we don't send something to a journal thinking, oh yeah, they'll never take this, right? 
And so I think there is maybe some possibilities if you look at the editorial, you know, people on the editorial board and so on, that, that they may be more opening, open to publishing those things. Because a lot of times when they are evaluating people for promotion tenure, they're looking at the journal and the prestige of the journal and the impact factors and all that. So if you can get a par piece into one of those journals, then it suddenly becomes legitimate, right? I mean, this, you have to understand kind of how legitimacy operates in, in higher education. And I think we probably aren't doing a very good job of that. And to some extent, you know, we've kind of created our own sub-journals off to, you know, we've kind of given up in some cases. This is just my own impression. Like, as I read these AERA journals now in education, this may be foreign to some of you in the room who aren't in education, but, you know, the, the sort of, think about the prestigious journals in your field. It's almost like those have been, ta you know, like, None of us, you know, really use those journals much anymore because we've got our own little journals on the side. I mean, there's a whole journal for like black males or something, you know. So then nobody like submits to these main journals anymore. And so therefore, you know, we've kind of given up the terrain to say, wait a minute, you know, I'm going to send this manuscript to this journal and I'm going to make them deal with it, you know, and, and see what happens. So we probably need to have better strategies for that as well, I think. I mean, you'd be surprised. Sometimes we create a bigger enemy than is actually out there. <laughs> I feel, too, that the, what, some of what you presented, you can't argue with outcomes. If you're able to change outcomes mm. with communities, in communities, yeah. um, that, that, that has to have a lot of strength. And that's what the Tucson program was able to do. They had prestigious researchers studying the outcomes of those programs and saying, look, these kids are doing better academically. And you know, that, I think that's another really good strategy that we need ways to, yeah, in an age of outcomes measurement, we need to play that game in order to make our case. Yeah. One last question. Hey, Gina, um, I'm guessing there's grad students in the room. Um, I think, you know, and knowing that there's a guide for action research dissertation, that's wonderful um, because uh, when I graduated, you know, definitely something I was always hearing is don't do community-based work, <laughs> you'll never graduate. <laughs> Not true, you can do it. Um, but I think it's really worthwhile to keep in mind that this skill set and some fancy letters behind your name, you don't have to be faculty. There's a lot of other options where exactly. you can take that skill set. So, um, you know, uh, having support for students who are pursuing that, um, that type of research while they're in grad school, that's another question. But just for folks in the room, you know, it, you don't have to be faculty. There's exactly. many opportunities with the state my or last two docs, or other. Yeah. My last two doc students got jobs at Research for Action in Philadelphia, which is, a, you know, a very progressive sort of in research institute. And, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily want to go the faculty route. And there are lots of other uh, organizations out there today that weren't there 20 years ago. Research institutes, serious research, and not ideological think tanks, but actual, you know, serious research institutes where you can get jobs. So there's other options, yeah. <laughs>